I hope that was fun to do a little socializing with one another. Um, and uh, and I, I, I find it a, a great every time we do that. So we're going to get into the meat of the program here and our special guest, Mark Siddle. So Mark, it, as one of the pioneers that brought Passive House to the UK, to the UK shores, Mark Siddle is the most experienced Passive House architect in Northeast England. He's director of architecture and research at Durham-based LEAP, the lovingly engineered architectural practice and co-chair of the REBA Northeast Sustainable Futures Forum. So REBA is similar to AIA, um, but the uh, Royal British version. Uh, he's also a trustee of the Association of Environment Conscious Building and a technical advisor for the Passive House Trust. By reflecting a high standard of architecture and raising standards of sustainable design, his practice creates low energy, low carbon homes and communities that enhance their immediate setting and are sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area. When he is not designing or spending time with his wife, Jen, and daughter, Hannah, you'll find him helping architects, engineers, and tradespeople close performance gaps through Passive House training and Passive House consultation events. So with that, we're super excited, Mark, to have you join us and to, to uh, uh, present about the large project. Please take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Zach. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, it's uh, always fun to uh, spread the word um, and uh, share the lessons that we've learned. So yeah, um, this should be, yeah, there we go. You should be seeing my screen now. Yeah, it looks great, thanks. Excellent. Okay, well, I'm not going to hang around. I'll get stuck into it, get through to the other side, and then we can an answer questions and uh, uh, have a bit of fun. Okay, so Larch Corner uh, is a project in uh, in the UK. I'm not going to give you a full map. Uh, it's in the, from, from where I sit. It's south uh, in the southern part of the UK, near the Cotswolds. Um, it won the UK uh, Passive House Awards this year for small projects. So um, I'll you'll kind of learn a little bit about how and why uh, it may have achieved that uh, this time around in this presentation. So first of all, just to set a bit of context, the site itself um, enhances biodiversity. We've got green, you know, kind of these photo site photographs here, I should tell you, the aerial views were taken 12, 18 months ago, and there's a lot more. Uh, it's, it's very much more heavily vegetated by now. Um, so anyway, there's uh, you know, grass and wildfire meadows, edible landscapes, native tree planting, um, there's some discrete permeable parking and um, big garden and the seed and roof. The velocity, the kind of basic philosophy was one of minimizing upfront carbon emissions in terms of construction, uh, using windows to frame views. And we used 21,000 screws in a design for disassembly strategy. So the building can be reused. Uh, it's a family home and it has wheelchair access. It's all on one floor um, for a range of reasons I'll get into. Um, yeah, so basically what we've got up on the right upper right you can see that the so the seed and roof with a photovoltaic array and you can see a sawtooth profile uh, to the house this is basically so it addresses this curvilinear corner the form factor as you can see is not ideal it's a bungalow but that's because of some very specific site constraints um, that related to basically getting planning permission internally um, it's light bright all, all of the rooms we've calculated the daylight uh, factors that would be in there so that we don't oversize the windows uh, there are window seats. The dining table is made from offcuts from C of CLT, which is also used to form the structure of the house. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got various different heights of spaces, but it's all exposed CLT internally. Uh, there's a large sliding folding door in the hall, which means that the office space come bedroom, there's a folding down bed in there, uh, you know, means it's got a lot of flexibility. And we've also got some sort of storage wall with playful LED lighting. So there's a lot of flexibility uh, built in uh, to the home so that when Mick is a grandparent, has his kind of family and grandkids come to stay, they can be at the opposite end of the house to him and he can retreat to the office. In terms of uh, the kind of the geekery, uh, the house has an air leakage of 0.47 air changes per hour at 50 pascals. So, uh, so 0.047 that is. So the air leakage would fit on the square of a one penny coin. Now that is, um, I forget, You'll be able to tell me how many, whether that's the size of a dollar or not, but anyway, it's tiny. Um, so it's 244 times more airtight than required by UK building regulations, 60 odd times better than, uh, you know, lower than, you know, less air leakage than required by uh, passive house standards. Um, the space heating demand, therefore, is very low, and uh, with, there's also a photovoltaic array. Um, I had the opportunity to work with 
Doc, uh, Professor David Johnston, Wolf, you know, uh, Professor Wolfgang Feist, uh, Oliver Ottinger and uh, Soren Pepper in a paper. And we kind of plotted um, the position of 2000 different passive house homes. If you put Larch Corner into that context, then you can see it's pretty much performing as predicted um, you know, for you know, the year in question. In this particular case, though, we do have just one occupant in the house at the, this particular point in time. PHPP, because I was very pessimistic in my PHPP uh, analysis, we, it looked like we were going to exceed 25 degrees Celsius for 9% of the year. Now, that's because I'd uh, assumed that windows were basically not going to be opened um, uh, because I was concerned about bugs and things in the local area. Monitoring, however, has shown that it exceeded 25 degrees Celsius for just about 5% of the year. Um, so what we yeah you know, so that's uh, good uh, happy with that and also um, kind of reflects some of the best uh, practice guidance that we've uh, the passive house trust is now proposing as well if we we'll make for, allow for um, light purge ventilation. In terms of energy performance, we monitored that as well. The photovoltaic array displaced 1.8 tons of carbon emissions uh, for the year in question. Um, there is a winter gap. So the house did emit carbon emissions. You can't play a game with this. You know, these emissions happened in reality. There's no net sum game with emissions. Um, with the air quality is uh, good. You know, we've used re relative humidity as a proxy for air quality here. And it's within acceptable ranges um, for you know, all, at all times. Um, a little bit on the drier side for certain points in the year. Uh, but again, that would probably change if we had uh, a higher occupancy in the house. The, uh, we've monitored the performance of the air source heat pump, uh, which is optimised for domestic hot water use. Uh, the low occupancy, however, and uh, the uh, low hot water demand is having an impact upon the coefficient performance. So it's coming out about 2.3 and there was a bit of rodent damage to the uh, pipework externally, which has since been protected and uh, repaired. Um, we calculated the upfront carbon emissions for the house. And what we found was that the photovoltaic array uh, accounted for 23% of the overall emissions. And um, yeah, this is despite the fact, or reflect, you know, there were 69 tonnes of carbon emissions overall. Perhaps coincidentally, it wasn't through clever design intent, but we when we calculated the uh, amount of uh, carbon that had been sequestered uh, through the CLT, and I'm not advocating using CLT in um, you know, small dwellings like this, but this is what ended up being a client requirement. We actually sequestered 69 tonnes. So again, don't fool yourselves. This is not a net zero building. The emissions didn't happen at the same time, so don't fool yourself. Um, contextual thinking. This is a 38% reduction in upfront carbon compared to a masonry build passive house. Uh, some lessons learned uh, would be that ne uh, next time we kind of go two storeys planning constraints aside, you, you know, any opportunity to go two storeys, uh, better use of uh, resources. Uh, also engineered I-beams would be a better option than, than um, CLT uh, for this type of uh, building. Using PHP, uh, pH ribbon to calculate the embodied carbon would make life a lot easier. The house is the first UK example of blown wood fibre insulation as opposed to cellulose insulation. We used finished ductwork cleanliness standards because because passive house doesn't actually say how clean the ductwork needs to be. Um, we use the ACB water standards for water efficiency. We've got domestic sprinkler system, which meant that we were able to use uh, low toxicity paints uh, internally as well, instead of covering things with plasterboard or or nasty paints. Lessons learned. Um, to tell you the truth, world class standards of air tightness were surprisingly easy. You know, you, you just design for zero and leave the rest to the trades on site. Um, the environmental performance declarations, obtaining those is tricky to get the information about the embodied carbon. Renewables can contribute quite significantly to upfront carbon, which is not to say that they're still a bad thing, but it's just recognising them for what they are. And um, we've got a uh, large, you know, this is a quote from Mick Woolley here, um, <clears throat> large corner gives me a wonderfully quiet, calm, and comfortable home that's extremely economical to run, and I really appreciate the superb daylight. Um, there's a documentary about uh, the project at PassiveHouseSecrets.co.uk and um, you, you'll be able to hear, hear from Mick and a bit more about the project uh, when you go over there. And there's a few other videos about other projects uh, that uh, I've worked on as well. Um, so that, that really kind of is a quick romp through of, uh, of the design. And if you've got any particular questions, then I'll be more than happy to answer them. That Thanks, was... Mark. 
That was fast. All right. That's fast. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I, I can, I, we, we can go backwards and go through things more slowly. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's great. Give you the headlines. Totally, um, totally. No, no, that's, that, I think we're all, we're just, we're, we're speechless. This is a beautiful project, great information. So, Sean, should I, should I yeah. jump into the, the, so at this point, we, we, we want to say thank you to the, the organizations that help make this work happen. Uh, so I'm going to do that real fast, and then we're going to get into discussion. So let me uh, share the screen here real, real quick. Um, so uh, everything we do comes thanks to our sponsors. So thank you to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Baxter Ingui Architects, Glavel Foam Glass Gravel, Minotaur All-in-One HVAC and Dehumidification Units, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, RDH Building Science, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. Our champion sponsors are Icon Windows and Doors and SEGA. And our stakeholder partner is NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thank you, too, to our patron sponsors, Aero Barrier, BR Plus A Consulting Engineers, Brennan Brennan Air Tightness and Insulation, Euroline Windows, Innotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Sanderson Sustainable Design, and U.S. Engineered Wood T-Stud. Thanks. All right, Mark. Well, hopefully you had a chance to catch your breath because that was, as Sydney put it, fast, factual, and fun. And so we got some <laughs> questions. We're going to uh, start off with Lloyd. Oh, me Unmute. Too. There. Um, Mark, actually, we've discussed this before, but I just thought it would be a good point to make, which is you said there that CLT might not be the most appropriate thing for a house like this. And this is an issue, again, we've discussed, but I thought maybe you could expand on that for uh everybody here yeah yeah sure so i mean um basically yeah, it's about efficiency of resources efficient use of resources what you know, clt soaks up a lot of timber it uses a lot of timber um you know to be kind of optimal you know we could have built this uh house using engineered i-beams and it would have probably you know, it would have been would it have probably cost a little bit less as well but mick was you know my client was adamant that he wanted a timber finish internally and um, he, he had a love uh, of the idea of building with CLT. So that's the route that we ended up going down. Um, but when I think as an architect about how we might scale things up, you know, this is this is a one off. Um, and I think that uh, if you're going three or four stories and you know, CLT might start to come in and uh, be more useful in those uh, sort of situations. Um, certainly when you start to think about acoustics and other factors that can be um, kind of addressed through sale, you know, using CLT construction. That might you know that might be appropriate but uh so hopefully that is kind of gives you a bit of a, an understanding for why i'm advocating um you know using an alternative construction when you have the opportunity thanks mark and now i can and i think that's a really good good discussion point about you know efficiency first is not always just talking about the passive components but materials as well and, you know, if you could use something, sometimes it's not always the best thing. So uh, I get beautiful home, but I, I kind of agree too. you know, we're going to use a lot of trees into tackling concrete and going over those big buildings. Yeah. That's a great resource for it on these small ones that, you know, the, the two by fours, two by sixes. And I see Mark there, even the T studs are a great alternative. So that's what we need. All right, Graham, over to you. Mark, long time, no talk. Beautiful hey, talk. how yeah. I say keep it well. Beautiful project. Um, so my question re is in regards to the embodied carbon and and knowing, I guess, knowing what you know from the calculations you did on this, do you feel compelled to do that for every project? I mean, in, in the sense of what decisions might that drive? And I just have to throw in another comment because I really appreciate your your messaging here. This whole idea of carbon sequestration in wood really bothers me because it it suggests that you should use as much wood as possible, and I, I yeah. that's more of a comment than anything else. Yeah, yeah, no, this, that's that's ridiculous. That, 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 that's the real danger. You know, that you kind of think, oh, I'm doing something good. I'm sequestering all this carbon, and you are, but you're also stealing the opportunity from other people to have done yeah. something. Yeah, and uh, I think sequestering across. The same amount of carbon across more projects yeah, is is a better way to do it. Um, the 
sorry, this, uh, yeah, I've gone off on the sequestration rounds. Uh, yeah, so in terms of calculations, um, yes, I think that it, I th it depends on, I did, I did it out of curiosity, to tell you the truth. I actually wrote longhand a spreadsheet, which I'm never going to do again. Um, you know, pH ribbon is definitely the thing to use. Um, now, I've just had, I've, there's a retrofit project uh, that I've worked on, and uh, that's uh, called Shepherd's Barn. And one of the things that we've discovered there just recently um, in going back over fa uh, facts and figures is that we've the specification of your photovoltaics can, you know, in this particular case, again, it's huge. It has, it has a huge impact upon the upfront emissions and your specification of your PV in, our, in, in one case. We've reduced, if we use the average, you know, if we just assume we've got the average photovoltaic, you know, monocrystalline cell, okay, we've, you know, the, we're using the best technology that we've found, we reduce the uh, upfront emissions by a factor of 8.5, you know, an 80, you know, 80 odd percent reduction wow. in emission, upfront emissions from your photovoltaics, simply by getting this, you know, choosing the right product. Mm. You, it does the same job, it's just as efficient as all the rest, but the embodied carbon was that much less. And that's huge. Um, and I would not have known that if I hadn't been looking at this kind of thing. Um, the embodied carbon of a timber frame building with cellulose insulation, come on, you know you're on the right track. Do you need to calculate it? Probably not, if I'm honest. Um, you know, I'm not going to say, you know, it, is, is it a good thing to do? I think that this is a huge opportunity for us, the, con you know, the conscientious designer, to reflect upon things and have an evidence base that they can then demonstrate to other people to help persuade them about doing the right things so it's not that you know, you know we we might know things already you know, passive house designers good form factor that means if you've got a good form factor that means you've got less embodied carbon inherently you know you've reduced maintenance costs you've reduced capital costs you know these are just good passive house thinkings that we tend to try and apply but, but if we can start to demonstrate the nuances of this through analysis, that's where the benefit will really come. It's helping to, it's, you know, P Passive House is shining a light on us and the work that we do. And I think that we can amplify that in, in other areas of it as well. So, yeah, so to put words in your mouth, I mean, in the way that we currently show, might showcase how much operational carbon a passive house is saving compared to a maybe a code compliant building we can also do the same thing with good material choices compared to typical material choices or whatever. yeah yeah so so the great, great the, point. the acb i mean again it's using the ph ribbon um, calculation tool but the acb allow you know, their assessment method is not based upon you should achieve this number of kilo you know and um, this many kilograms of carbon per meter square we recognize that that was but well, we don't really know what the best approaches were. We don't have scientific ev you know, an evidence base to pull from. What we can say is an assessment methodology is appropriate <laughs> and we need to be able to compare different approaches and then we can engage in a thoughtful um, debate. Thank you. Great stuff. Now, you might, we might have answered Paul and Zach's questions, but we'll keep diving into it. So Paul, I apologize for skipping you, but you're next. Yeah, I just wondered um, whether the house meets, it meets passive house standard, obviously, does it meet the new AECB standard as well? Inherently. You yeah, so um, the, the, well, I suppose there's the, well, there's the AECB uh, building standard. It, 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 in terms of the energy performance side, yes, it addresses that. There are voluntary standards, um, you relating to whole life carbon. Um, the, the work that I did predated <laughs> that standard. So the you know, so that you know, I can't even I can't guarantee you that it's all the calculations are done in accordance with all of the um, the methodologies that we now include within the ACB building standard life you know the whole life carbon standard um, in terms of using you know, uh, e you know the right EPDs and the right measurement methodologies. So this is this was a you know this was done um, predating that, but I'd I'd be fairly confident that it's it's in the right it's doing the right thing. It looks like it. I, I did compare my analysis with the RIBA's 2030 challenge, uh, which is a bit like the AIA's uh, 2030 challenge, just to contextualize things. Um, and there is an embodied carbon target from the RIBA and, and as well as operational target. And I did compare. Um, let me just see if I can pull that up, actually. 
um, from a different slide presentation. Um, uh, where are we? Oh, there we are. So I, I, I compared, you know, we've got the RIBA 2030 targets and um, Larch Corner. Larch Corner was basically uh, as measured. And we've got, as I say, we've got, a, a, Mick has a, a, an electric car. So if we, you know, we can compare it to the 2030 targets here. Um, and we've got, if we exclude the you know, car, exclude car use, then we're satisfying that performance criteria. Upfront carbon, uh, we're in the right sort of ballpark. Um, you know, if we're kind of net of PV, then we're kind of, if, you know, we've, we were showing that we could do considerably better. Um, so yeah, all in all, fairly happy with, with where, how it compares to other UK metrics. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. And for those that are here in North America and trying to keep up with Mark and all the UK, I've, I've tried to be as fast as he is on finding some of these resources. So we all can keep up with what's happening over there when we're looking at these things. So thanks, Mark. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Zach, you had a question, which I did. I mean, I think, I think, it, I, I think it, I, I feel like it's uh, perhaps answered more or less. I think that what, what I'd like to do is just to, is take the chance to, um, build on um, Mark what you were talking about with um, the notion that we shouldn't that that we shouldn't think of building using a bunch of uh, wood to sequester carbon in a single project um, and I, I was glad that you brought that up it's a, it's a concept uh, that I first heard from Rainer Fluger uh, when I had the chance of, to interview him from he's from the University of Innsbruck and he's involved in the outfit project um, research around the outfit project and this notion that that there is you know a certain um, amount of sustainably produced timber that that could you know reasonably you could reasonably argue that that sequesters carbon um, but it's not limitless and so if we decide to gobble you know kind of one project gobble up a, a bunch of that then there's less available for other projects and therefore there's more conventional um, timber that's going to be wasteful you know that it d does not sequester carbon that's going to be used in projects so it's this notion it's 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 in some ways very similar to uh, the idea that we really should be thinking about renewable energy beyond the confines of a single project, but instead, you know, um, uh, across the built environment, but more importantly, at utility scale, it's like if, if we only focus that, that sometimes the focus on the boundary conditions of just a project can lead us to, to um, bad decisions. Um, well, fundamentally, so, yeah, yeah, no, I think... Uh, being very conscious of your boundary conditions um, right. you know, is is the key thing, and always challenging your own assumptions in in that regard. Um, yeah, I think that at any point in time, we've got to recognise that resources are finite. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and I think that's the basically the argument that you were just putting forward there from you know, Raina, um, is that you know, we recognise that right now we've got a limited amount of materials that we can use, and we should use them in the most thoughtful way. Um, and you know, okay, if this runs on for hundreds of years, then we've kind of got theoretically infinite over time. But right now, we've only got right. a certain amount, um, and we should make use of that in the in the right way. Yeah, excellent. So, Mark, you're telling me that we're not growing trees on Mars yet? Come on, you know, no, it's great stuff, and it's a really good point. I know Jeff Spiritos, who usually joins us on these events, he'd be all for this discussion of mass timber. So, great, great points on again stressing efficiency first not only by you know putting the passwords principles, but just looking at the, the whole thing. And for those that are interested too, I know Zach's gonna comment, but uh, we're gonna have Chris Magwin on next week talking about embodied carbon or uh, materials carbon emissions is the phrase that he likes to use. Um, Eric, you were up next in the I queue. Was, I was gonna applaud Mr. Mark for, for uh, doing his homework and going beyond the, the splashy stuff despite the fact that, as he pointed out, it's often hard to get manufacturer information. I had two questions where I suspected there's a lot more depth that he didn't go into. For example, uh, solar panels, uh, uh, so getting, getting manufacturer information, or since you've been through that, are there any generalizations you can make? For example, are you worried about the cadmium? Are you worried about the energy and time that it takes to make uh, monocrystalline uh, panels or, and the other one was uh, you talked about uh, time of use from an energy uh, perspective and from a carbon perspective, specifically in the winter. 
So, and I wasn't sure whether you're just talking about, hey, that's when the peaker plants run or, I don't know. I suspected okay. there was a lot you could teach us. Yeah, okay. So uh, in terms of digging into the, the nasty materials that get used in PV and things like that, that's not a level that I've actually dived into yet. Um, and probably, and I probably won't, uh, but suffice to say, you know, um, that one of the things that does work concern me is actual ethical procurement. <laughs> Which you know, and because what we find is that a lot of the um, PV that's coming out of China is made from a suppressed minority, um, and I think that we need to, if you know, as as ethical designers, we need to be mindful of that side of procurement as well. So it's not all about carbon; it's about people, and you know, so so that's where my core concern, shall we say, would uh, sort of reside. Um, to pick up on the um uh, just go to that slide or a slide uh what we've got is i think this you know this is this kind of information that you were talking about in terms of the winter gap um and how that has an impact well basically what we've got is the one whereby we've got the photovoltaics generating electricity and exporting to the grid some of the electricity is used in the house um, some of the electricity is still exported to the, uh, to the grid because of utilization factors. What we found was that um, around about 40% of the energy was you know, from the PV was used inside the house. And the other uh, remaining percentage, uh, the other you know, um, was actually exported to the grid. So you know, a lot of what, in my experience, a photovoltaic salesman will basically tell you that it's going to generate this many photovoltaic, you know, this many kilowatts of worth of energy, and therefore the cost of uh, the, the PV to the owner is Y. Okay, you kill know, your kilowatt hours, you cut your um, cents per kilowatt hour, whatever you pay. Um, but the fact is, you've got to take into account the utilization factor if you really want to understand the proper cost to the homeowner. <laughs> Now, hopefully they can sell stuff to the grid and they can make some money back. But if they can't, then you need to be mindful of that utilization factor. And it's going to differ between building to building. Um, uh, but I have found that around about this 40 percent mark seems to um, carry across a few projects um, that I, some of which I what you know, this is the only one that I've designed and measured and got that uh, information from. But I have spoken to other homeowners of passive house buildings in northern Europe. That have photovoltaic arrays and we it's a similar sort of number does that suggest Thankfully, a question? i assume the the further oops also more heat whereas uh winter in your area right yeah yeah different climate zones are probably going to be affected in different ways so if you're down i don't know new mexico i think you'd probably get a different set of figures um but if you're up at um sort of uh yeah, I'm at 55 degrees north, so 52 degrees north or something like that. This is this might be respective of what you could expect, perhaps. Great insights, everyone. Thanks for that info. Um, Mark, I want to just go back to the, you talked about the air tightness portion where you said it's easy and just wondering why did the team find it so easy? Was it, you know, were they trained beforehand? Was it, if you want to just kind of, Explain, yeah, no, explain yeah, that comment because yeah, that's that's a that's a good novel one, and I know that you you're from a construction kind of background, Sean. So, um, yeah, I mean, basically, um, we designed. I mean, I th there was, to be honest, I think there were several factors that led this to um, a rather bizarre and uh, result that we were not trying to achieve. <laughs> okay, this was not you know, don't try this at home, kids. Uh, you know, it's not cost effective to try and replicate these results. You know, you've got better things to do. There are better and more cost effective ways to save energy. It's a novel result. OK, but it goes to show that we, there is an opportunity for us to go a lot further. And by the way, this is the third most airtight house in the world. And I would yeah, and I say I say this not to show off that this is the third most airtight house, but because positions number one, two, four, five, six and seven are all held by the same builder over in Austria. That's the bit that's really, yeah, he's got it dialed in, <laughs> you know, or his team, I should say. Um, so um, how, how did it happen? Well, partly I think the CLT 
helped because we've got fewer joints. Okay, so the lesson isn't use CLT, it's look for find you, know, you use large sheets of sheet materials with fewer joints. The next thing is keeping things simple, of course, in terms of you know, albeit the crazy kind of sawtooth qualities and everything else, it is quite a simple shape. Um, the other one uh, is, you know, so simplicity is key you know, on, on every level, you know, in terms of the material specifications, in terms of buildability. Then you set, you, as long as you've detailed and identified all of the, as a designer, as long as you've identified all of the locations where air leakage can happen, and you've detailed those, the builder, the tradespeople have got the opportunity to undertake the work and not miss any bits. Um, so that's so I approach things as an architect. You know, I have a zero AI policy, you know, which is no architect's instructions. It needs to be all dialed in and dealt with before we get on site. Um, and then um, you know, for the trades, uh, at the beginning of the pro the, the air tightness champion on site uh, was actually the client. He, he ended up uh, rolling up and doing a lot of the air tightness taping. Um, and he was also ably supported by... Um, uh, uh, Andy Mackay, who was the uh, yeah, tradesperson on site, a joiner, an extraordinary joiner, uh, carpenter. Um, but uh, uh, during the project, Andy then trained to become a certified passive house tradesperson. So he kind of got himself equipped with all the necessary knowledge. So as I say, it was it was luck, but um, and for good fortune, and it's great for bragging rights when I go down the pub uh, with passive house nerds. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um, and I appreciate too how you didn't round down because typically you would have got a zero by the real rule. So the fact that you kept it at a point zero four seven is uh, is appreciated. Because well, yeah, in PHPP it's zero, but you know. But again, you know, you need the brain right, so you need some kind of number. But we'll just give you a big zero. <laughs> um, I, I could imagine too the blow or test. Um, I'm sure you might have had some errors first on the on the machine when you're getting that low. So that must have yeah, also well, been a bit we, of a challenge. We, yeah, there's a story to that. Paul Jennings, um, one of the UK's best uh, and most experienced blower door engineers, uh, he he already uses a small fan. Um, let's let me see if I can. Uh, he 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 basically uses a duct blaster. Um, it's uh, to 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 do the blower door tests. Um, yeah, and let's, let's go. Yeah, this one. Uh, just going to share another picture slide. Get that one now. Um, so yeah, Paul, Paul, Paul uh, uses his duct blaster. Um, we, we did the preliminary blower door test and we got some really good results. Uh, we were kind of in you know, uh, 0.09 sort of uh, territory. So we knew, we knew it was going to be good and we were going to be happy with the results. Um, but so Paul then started to try, I said, look, your calibration, you're going to go out of calibration on your fan. Um, you know, so for the completion test, we want to you know, see what we can you know, have a proper test that we, where it's a you know, proper bona fide thing. So we started to look around to see whether it could get recalibrated to a smaller uh, ring size. And uh, we found out that it was going to have, it was, Paul was going to have to send his fan away to Holland because we didn't have calibration fans suitable in the UK at that point. Well, as the project rolled on, uh, we, you know, uh, it turned out this rear who do a lot of the um, calibration uh, work, they just about had dialed in this process. So I think Paul's fan was the first one to be tested at such a low volume. So it was a calibrated fan test. This is not, this is within measurement error of a standard blower door, albeit it had to be properly calibrated to do that. So yeah, you can't take the bragging rights away, I'm afraid. Um, that is a fantastic story. So when you're not at the pub, it's like, and take this and take this. This is a true number. And I can take you back out in the alley too, but this yeah. is dialed in. <laughs> yeah. So I do, you know, we, we do have a, uh, a version of the blower door report that we share, um, you know, that has been calculated to reflect UK methodologies, American methodologies, you know, because of how you measure areas and volumes. Um, so, uh, so, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we made sure that we could probably brag about it. <laughs> nice work, fantastic. Um, Graham had a question, so Graham, pop back on for your simple but enlightening yeah, question. Hey, Mark, what was the single biggest source of heat loss? I'm guessing air leakage was not it. Ooh, 
I'd have to go. I thought, yeah, I, well, I get the walls and the roof. It's going to be the walls simply by the fact that there's more, you know, more of it. Um, yeah, I think, you know, yeah, there we go. There's going to be fabric losses. <laughs> go work it out. Uh, <laughs> Mark, for a second there, I thought Graham was going to stump you, and I was like, "Wow, this could be this could be a first, But no, yeah, you you went back to the basics. So, good stuff. Might, it might be the windows. No, so I don't no. think so. The, the windows have got gains, so we could net that one out if we play the game. Um, but I think also the windows. We the windows, as I say, all we we calculate day. Uh, you know, we calculate the daylight factor. So we know you know, the just in case you don't have daylight factors in the States, what it is is basically uh, we have a standard overcast sky of 100,000 lux, and then we're looking to achieve certain light levels, 200 lux, so 2% daylight factor uh, with, you know, within, within certain rooms. So we've calculated all daylight factors so we're not overglazing. And that means that we, you know, we don't need to put on expensive solar shading because it's inherently built in because you made the windows the right size in the first place. And you know, the windows then become nice, perfect picture frames for views and other opportunities. Um, so it, it kind of it's a nice countenance to a lot of other architectural stuff that's going on out there. Uh, but it, 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 it works on a number of different levels. I feel like that efficiency first has gone on a whole bunch of different you know, things that we typically don't work talk about. But you guys uh, definitely apply it. So again, great project. Um, I think that was it for questions. Zach, do you have another one? I well, I do. So, so I, I wonder when we talk about embodied carbon, if if if, uh, and I and your point is well taken. That should we even worry about um, uh, calculating it if we're doing you know all that we're doing a bunch of natural materials and and uh, timber. Um, but if we are in the if we are if we're going down the path of of uh, accounting for body carbon, I wonder if solar PV should be really kind of um, taken separately from the building itself, uh, yeah. just because the build if we're doing building to building calculations, really what's important I think is understanding the structure of the building and what's going into the building. Yeah, I don't know what your I, thoughts I think are. It starts to get very fiddly, and I'm really not going to say that I, you know, this is, I'm, I'm starting, you know, we are scratching at the edges of uh, what I know, should we say, in terms of appropriate ways. I would tend, to, I tend to agree as an architect that the PV should be excluded and we should consider the P, because it's generating electricity, we should call it part of the grid. <laughs> Right. Um, right. But the thing is, I'm mindful of the fact that if you've got building integrated PV, so it's replacing roof tiles or it's mm. replacing glazing systems, curtain walling, and it's fully integrated, then it starts to become a bit of a muddy field. Right. Um, so I think I don't have an easy answer. Um, I know that there's I learned yesterday that the some of the European standards that are looking at embodied carbon are looking at alter you know, there's a consultation out at the moment for what you're know, trying to find a better way to deal with things um yeah so it, it's a it's a muddy area mm -hmm. uh and i i'd say why look at pv what about a wind turbine don't stick crap on your roof um you buy it you invest in community renewables instead because they're generally lower carbon emissions up front um and they're more affordable you mm -hmm. there's a predilection for zero carbon there's net zero that yeah and it, it, it's yeah. it's a it it's a lot more cost effective to do something at a community scale because if you put it on your own roof you're tripling the cost and the other thing is if we're thinking about this sensibly as designers and you know, there are 20 million homes in on oh, you know, 25 million homes in the uk not everyone a single one is going to be suited to pv no and then no. what will the homeowners do will they maintain it you know you know, what happens when it mm -hmm. does break down because it will at mm -hmm. some point it will break down will they, they will they fix it and will they maintain it and you know or will a lot of capital be locked up in this beautiful array that pleased an ego for a few years and then um yeah then what i like the idea of, i live at 55 degrees north okay so if we get if but if, if you go across from the uk there's a little island just off denmark called marstall and they've got 33,000 square meters of solar thermal panels in a field. They've got a subterranean swimming pool that's super insulated and they pump the heat to the houses for three and a half euro cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, which is 
not a lot of money yeah, in yeah. UK terms. Um, you know, especially when we've got massive you know, gas price hike at the moment. Um, so there is there are sensible ways to do things. Yeah, well said. Yeah, and when it even comes to the PV, a lot of times it's like, oh, you need to put a metal roof down first, and then you put a solar panel on. Well, those two things are the most expensive solar roofs. You know, you can just put. Um, you know, there's other methods of doing that. So, good, good point. Think bigger. Um, Mary had a question. Mary James. Hi, I just wanted you to expand on what you were saying about shading, because you were saying that you didn't need shading because of the way you sized the windows, but don't, aren't there some facades where you need shading anyway? Um, yeah, there, there, there will be buildings, there will be designs that will be definitely benefit from shading in, 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 in certain circumstances. I'm not saying that thou shalt, you know, that I'm not saying thou shalt, should not shade, <laughs> you know, it's a case of you, you know, the, the way you know whether you need shading or not is you model it in PHPP and you define to, uh, find out whether it's got an overheating risk or not. Um, you, but by right sizing the windows for daylight, you're not oversizing them. Yeah, you know, I'm an architect. I have a predator, it's almost in my DNA to oversize windows. Okay. You, so, um, you, because if I read a magazine, uh, <laughs> I think Mark's happy with that. Uh, um, yeah, so, um, you, know, basically, what we've, you, know, if we, yeah, you read too many magazines, you get seduced by the the pretty pictures, and you, you your your hand starts to move around, and you want to you know, draw bigger windows. You don't need bigger windows necessarily. You size them properly, and the way you can. So the best thing that I I've done is develop a tool um, that sold with PH Ribbon, by the way. I know, and I'm not trying to sell that product, by the way. It's yeah, there are other tools out there, um, but I, I I basically wrote my own daylighting calculation tool, and then Tim had developed the PH Ribbon, and I said, well, look, you you. I'm, I'm using this for myself. If you, if you want to sell it, sell it. Let's just get it out there so people can use, you know, do these things. And it works with, a bit with PHPP. Um, but uh, by getting the windows the right size and calibrating yourself, this is the other thing that I, I've learned, is that you know, we, need, we talk about, is the model useful? But it's, are we useful? We need to understand and interpret our models. PHPP is based upon 25 year climate data. Yet the weather, you know, if we put data loggers in, we're, me we're measuring what happened this year, which is not in that data set. And what, we're, what really interests me is how does the building perform in an overheating scenario in that year? Because climate change is going to broadly mean that we get more of these overheating scenarios more frequently. <laughs> so if we can cope with one instance and we can roll it out okay, we can probably cope with more frequent ones. So going back and sticking sticking a few temperature loggers in your property your projects, seeing what happens in practice is the greatest way of you know kind of refining what you do and dialing in your processes. And the same for daylight. Get a little look, you know, looks meter, do your daylight calculation tool, measure what happened in practice and find out whether people are happy and keep those conversations going. Um, Excellent. Sorry, Mark, the, the chat's going uh, a little crazy at the moment. I was just trying to find questions and Graham, I thought no, I had I a question about a sewer. I just want to finish on the shading <laughs> thing and I'll loop back round. And it's the one where large corner has got big thick walls. So if you position the window kind of halfway in or something, you're using the reveals as part of that shading process. Um, Mick has since confession yeah, added some ex additional shading on the outside. PHPP said it wasn't necessarily required, but each to their own um, and this is the other thing if we as designers include the shading from day one and it's showing that it's just about acceptable how the hell is somebody then going to um, kind of adapt their building in the future <laughs> they're going to either and, and I, you know, I did do, do a um, an overheating training uh, so summer comfort training in, in, in New York uh, good few in 2016 I think it was um, and yeah, Nick and Nick Grant and I came over and we looked at the climate zones in the US and I know that you need air conditioning in, in some of them. Um, so I'm not trying to say that you shouldn't do that. I'm just saying that this is what works in our particular project. Thanks, Mark, for clarifying. That's great. Um, it's funny, I was looking at the chat and Graham was just talking about swimming pools. And I think it was more of a, a pun than it was, it was a question. All right, Tim, I know you had a question, but we're going to go over to Zach to do some announcements and we'll come back to a couple more questions. So keep them in the chat and I'll gather them up. Oh, Zach, you're, you're muted. Hello. 
There you go. Um, Yes, so we've got some great great events coming up. Uh, Right now on the Pass Fast podcast, we have an interview that Mary James, um, who's on the call right now, and Ilka Cassidy conducted with Alana Judah of the Acorn Resilience and Sustainability um, based in Vancouver. So please check that out on the Pass Fast podcast. And then uh, tomorrow, and I just shared this in a chat, there's info and registration link for this for the LAMA Lux Pass Fast Component Spotlight. Tomorrow, we're, we're doing one of our uh, special Pass Fast Component Spotlights, and it's focused on LAMA Lux, um, glass architecture living with light. So if you're interested in, in how to do a a skylight in a passive house project and uh, a component solutions for that, please join us tomorrow for this presentation um, at 10 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern. And I hope to see you there. Um, Next Tuesday, Construction Tech will be all about embodied carbon. So this is low rise building as a climate solution with Chris Magwood of the Endeavor Center. Um, Chris is a leading thinker in uh, embodied carbon, the relationship of embodied carbon and operational carbon. And uh, there's a a report that he just uh, produced um, that he'll be drawing from during that conversation. So it should be very uh, provocative as a, in, 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 in conversation and thinking about how this, uh, this, um, these questions apply to Pass Files. Join us on Tuesday. Then on Wednesday, we'll be joined by the fantastic folks at Green Hammer uh, based in Portland, Oregon. And they'll be talking about the New Day School, which is a zero net energy school retrofit in Portland, Oregon. And it's not a passive house, but it does, um, it, it does air tightness and uh, thermal bridging analysis, um, smart, uh, smart mechanicals, um, passive, passive design, and um, a blower door test. So there's um, lots of uh, stuff from, from our uh, kind of palette of, of design moves and construction moves applied in that uh, uh, preschool. Um, and then finally, next Thursday, we will kick off the first ever Building Performance Interactive. Um, and this is a UK and Ireland based program that will run at uh, 2 p.m. British summertime, which is 6 a.m. Pacific and 9 a.m. Eastern. And this is with co host Hugh Wiriski of Partel, Mike Jacobs of Kiss House, and Ben Adam Smith of House Planning Help. And the special guest on this first episode will be Tomas O'Leary. So um, there's, I'll, I'll share this link as well for everyone so you can join us. Register for that and join us. Thank you. Lots of great stuff in the pipeline. Like always, thanks, Zach, for for that. Hopefully everyone updated their calendars for tomorrow's event and next week's calendar. Lots of good stuff. So it is the top of the hour. We do have uh, four more questions in the queue, but uh, I understand that some of you might uh, actually be going to take your lunch break. Some of you might need another cup of coffee and some of you might be putting your kids to bed, which typically doesn't happen in the UK, but we have an earlier episode you guys get the happy hour shift. So um, we hope to see you soon. Thank you for joining us. And we'll keep going on with the questions, Mark. Uh, Tim was next in the queue. So Tim, hopefully you're still with us. Go for it. Yeah, hi, uh, Mark. uh, Talking about community solar over individual solar on buildings. if, If one goes community solar, doesn't that then leave the building roof uh, in question kind of as wasted space. Whereas if, if you know, individual buildings had solar, whatever then land might be occupied by a fairly large, and I've seen man, many of them, uh, solar array could be given over to meadow or forest or some other mm-hmm. carbon capture, capturing <laughs> biodiversity supporting land. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I, Maybe I'm a, maybe I have a bl- bit of a blunt tooled approach to it, um, but it's that one of uh, we're in a fix financially um, from a climate perspective. We've only got one shot of money to kind of try and address these kinds of issues. So my argument is we should do the least cost approach first, and um, that that would mean that community works would come earlier. And and it's not necessarily community solar; it's community wind. It's community whatever. You know, um, but I think that there's we in the UK wind is far more cost effective, um, but and it's it's a hard win sometimes to convince a client to uh, go with wind rather than PV because that seems to be on trend. Um, so yeah, I th- I think that if you is is a roof wasted if it's not got PV on 
or something like that or solar thermal i don't think so because it's more it's if it's more cost effective to do something else then surely we should be advocating that uh is you know, if there's an yeah you know, how many acres are given over to horses you know kind of a field for horses or something like that could it be given over to a different purpose that would be more beneficial you know uh, to a community level i don't know yeah it's 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 i'm just putting it out there as a conversation piece i'm not saying that i've got the answer the answer i've just got hopefully some fresh and different ways of thinking to help challenge those boundary conditions that we were talking about earlier on good stuff mark tim anything else or you're good uh no i think i i think that's great i i, I think uh as as mark might have mentioned you know looking at at it from an embodied carbon point of view as well it's quite feasible that the community array would end up using way less materials per kilowatt hour um, as as compared to individual units on individual homes uh, so that that's something i think that but it, it could it's, it's could all, be a deal breaker in for the question it, it's also for me yeah as an architect it's that one of maintenance you know what happens when it goes wrong and if, it, if you end up with locked up capital doing nothing because somebody didn't fix the broken inverter, but if it's at a community scale, you can employ somebody to go and do regular checks and to get that work done. You know, so that's that's how yeah. my head works. I, I think one more concern that I would add would be, you know, transport of energy. I, I think something like 30% of it is lost in transport. And, and so I would assume then that an array on on the very building would lose that much less. So you still have to, um, you know, get that energy from the community um, array to to the homes, and and that would, you know, it's a lot of copper, a lot of a lot of plastic wiring, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it'd be it'd be a very very interesting study to do from from a, an embodied carbon point of view. I, I, in fact, um, a slight tangent. I understand that PHPP ten um, is in it's in the running, and I think that if I understand correctly, then it's going to have a more of a neighbourhoods master planning component associated with it. Yet another worksheet for the fanboys. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think that you know, we can start to engage in these kind of conversations in a broader context as well. Thank you. Sorry, everybody, I was just trying to find the pH ribbon link, but I can't find it so quickly. So I'll try to dig that up. Um, sorry, Sandra had more of a question, but I she had a couple of points and I wasn't sure she wanted to comment or ask any questions. So Sandra, are you still with us? Hey there. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that if people are working on uh, scenario planning, um, resiliency and uh, green buildings, passive house buildings. Um, they can get uh, Canadian climate data from climatedata.ca and it's got different scenarios. So um, it's under the UN uh, emission scenarios. So um, I recently had uh, engineers use this uh, type of data and take a look at um, uh, the future performance of mechanical heating and cooling systems for for future um, humidity levels and and uh, cooling requirements for a um, a large building in in Vancouver and it worked out quite well for that so um, I'm not sure how you'd get the data into um, PHPP software but um, yeah so I'd, I'd be open to hearing back from other people about that. Yes, Andrew, that's a good point because it, for those that aren't, uh, have been here to a lot of our shows, one of the projects up in Smithers um, had about a bit of a, not a colossal issue, but one of the issues with the modeling, not only did the contractor take out the tree, the contractor decided to change the spec of the glass, but they were using old weather data and as Monty Paulson says, it, we went back to the future because the data is 1985 data. And uh, and so now a lot of the PHP, you're able to import different data sets to look at the next 20 years or the next 30 years so that you're making sure that you're not building something that is overheating today because the data is, as uh, you know, you're out, hanging out with Michael J. Fox and, and the crew. So 
it's, it's really good stuff. So thanks, Sandra, for putting that, that uh, info in, and it's a good point. Thank you. Um, Graham, back to you. I, I'm not sure I have any questions and more of a series of smart ass comments, but uh, hey, well, we enjoy did, them all I, today. I did want to know if you can get into that underground swimming pool. That sounds kind of nice in the winter, but uh, the main, I guess my main, the only possibly relevant point was, um, isn't climate change actually making, leading to more extremes in climate? So while we have to worry about overheating, can, or might we also end up with periods of extreme cold as well? Like it's not just planning for summer performance, but maybe winter performance under more extreme conditions as well. Yeah, I think, well, I think Passive House does a reasonable job at nailing that. Uh, so that, yeah, I think we, we can fairly well be happy that we you know, winter is not the issue. In the UK, um, yeah, the idea of overheating, you know, we have such a kind of a weird temperate climate that we kind of struggle to believe that, that a building can overheat. You know, yeah, I have clients that sort of go, ah, oh, I, I, I just wish my house would overheat. You know, you know, you'd like a warm, comfortable home, but you don't want a house that overheats. Over, if overheating is when you lose control over your comfort. Um, and I think, but so, you know, it's, it's a challenging kind of conversation to, to have at different points. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, climate, cli the climate's going to go weird, but I think that uh, from my experience, it's, it's overheating, which is the, the area that I, is my worry, my concern, my, the, the Achilles heel. And that's where PHPP sells itself to me because, you know, it's getting the, getting the space heating demand is like falling off a log uh, once you've done a few projects, you know, you know, you know, your right hand knows where to move to make things happen. Getting, avoiding overheating, I guess it wrong every time. You know, it's, you know, it needs that modeling, it needs that execution, it needs the analysis so that you can deliver a nice, comfortable home. Uh, in the kind of breakout room earlier on, um, we got into conversation about, well, basically marketing Passive House, how do we sell it? And I, I kind of uh, explained that, in my view, clients don't really want me, you know, not boo-hoo, but I mean, they, they don't want me, they don't want an architect, they, what they want is a lifestyle. <laughs> And, you know, and I'm a conduit towards that lifestyle. And Passive House gives them control. And, you know, and it gives them control. And control comes in cans, not cannots, okay? And that controls is comfort, air quality, noise, and sunlight, okay? If you give people control over those four things, then you've pretty well, pretty well got it licked. Every once in a while, you Mark, you just open your hand and just do one of those because we know it's a mic drop. So good point. Um, continue along in the questions. Dan, you're next. Hi, thank you, uh, Mark. That was a great presentation. I have a fairly mundane question and maybe you mentioned it, but how are you doing water heating for your residential projects? And the reason I ask is I've been, I'm in New York and I've been experimenting with a water heater that came from England, which is built here as the solar assisted heat pump water heater. So it replaces a heat pump water heater by not having an air exchange indoors. It has a refrigeration panel that goes outside and it seems to yeah. work really well. I'm wondering if that's commonly used in Europe or have I found a really oddball water heater? Um, I'm, yeah, I will kind of hit, this is where I will profess to be an architect, uh, not a services engineer, um, but the bits that I do, you know, I, I do train passive house designers. So the bits that I do know about um, heat pumps and things like that is that, and, and large corner in particular, uh, there, are, there are different refrigerants that are uh, more ideal for providing hot water. Now, in a passive house, we know that the, dom the domestic hot water demand tends to be higher than the space heating demand. Um, so uh, using um, uh, carbon dioxide, nice glo low global warm potential <laughs> also mm -hmm. it it does a very good job at heating hot water uh, when it's uh, used in a, a, in a in a heat pump so we've so large corner used uh, uses um, carbon dioxide as its refrigerant um, it's a mitsubishi uh, product um, i forget the particular model um you know, that uh, was used yes that has the half the pump outside and then the cylinder and other bits and pieces inside i don't know 
I didn't know heat pumps worked in a different way. <laughs> um, uh, there's there's uh, some other refrigerants that are quite uh, that are quite good that are also kind of quite well suited to passive house, um, but they have a um, they've got higher global warming potential and they're less suited, they're less optimized, should we say, for domestic hot water. The um, the Mitsubishi unit that you're mentioning is that residential scale or is that multifamily? Uh, it's single single dwelling. The one that I'm I've worked with. Uh, there may be others, but again, it's I'm I'm, a, I'm firmly an architect, and uh, you know, you're asking engineer questions that are more suited to a building services engineer. Okay, thank you. And, and Dan, that's a unit that we keep asking Mitsubishi to bring across the pond, and we get the it's gonna you know we get the it's happening. We're like you know three or four years waiting for it. So, um, but again, sometimes you know go on a trip to Europe and pick one up and bring it home and put in your luggage because. You know, make it work that way. Um, okay, there's a few more uh, questions in the queue, Mark, so you can't go away too quick. Um, David, uh, sorry, David Watton from Toronto, you had a question. Sorry, I just organized a few more and put in the queue in the chat. Okay, okay great. Th thanks. Sure, so I, I, um, thanks very much. I love the presentation and your attention to carbon and, and the embodied carbon side of things. And obviously with the solar and things these are things that all need to be looked at so i was wondering if you combined them did you actually do it like a cost per ton of carbon conserved to see what was the best financial <sighs> bang for your buck on the carbon side or no no didn't get that far um yeah it was i think if we had we'd have you know, well i the, the client was very you know mick he's a wonderful guy um but i think that at the, that particular point at the very least he was he had his heart set on clt so it, you know the cost per kilowatt hour or cost per ton of carbon saved was not it wouldn't have won the carbon it wouldn't have won the argument should we say in a logical world but his, he had his, his heart was involved um yeah so that's yeah so i, th I think that uh, it's a good thing to do your know, cost per ton of carbon saved or th these kind of things would be a, an interesting way of looking at things Great. Thanks. And again, thanks for the presentation. It was great. Great. Well, again, I mean, the fact you found a client that wanted to do this, you know, again, they have their prescriptive things they want and their wish list, and you deliver. So, yeah. Um, uh, Devin Basher, are you still with us? I don't see you, Devin. Hi. There you are. Great. Hello. Thank you very much. Um, great presentation. And uh, I really appreciate it. I was curious about the wood fiber insulation. That's not something I'm super familiar with as to why you chose that. Was it based on like uh, carbon or performance? And was that a Gutex uh, wood fiber installation? Okay. Um, we used a range of different wood fibers on the project. Um, the, we used wood, it was a, we used some, uh, we used some Gutex, we used some Pavitex. Uh, we also use Styco, and the one that was, you know, so the Gutex and the Pavitex were both um, rigid boards, mm -hmm. but the, the novel, the interesting, the UK first, uh, was actually the use of blown wood fibre insulation, right. now, um, I th which I think is what you were driving at. Now, yeah. uh, that was manufactured by Styco, and uh, what made that interesting was that it cost less. Yay! Yeah, it costs less than cellulose. Um, so, you know, the, you know, and because what we find is that when you're injecting uh, the cellulose insulation, it's got to go in at a certain density. Yeah. And it's the same for the wood fiber, but we didn't need to inject it at such a high density when we we're using wood fiber and the conductivity was the same. So therefore we could use less quantity of material to uh, achieve the same U values and therefore save money. Okay. Uh, it appears like it's a more fine product than the cellulose that that uh, that that I've seen. So a lower density and a lower amount of material. So it's a lower. It was a cost metric that was driving that. And it, 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 yeah, cost fell into that. Uh, I think that it's that uh, I've not. You know, from what I understand, it, it's to do with the, the reason you can put inject it at a lower density. It's because of the way they all sort of meshes and hangs together and and uh traps the you know traps air pockets at the same time and it just is so you just you know to, to achieve the same job with cellulose you just need a higher density to do that because it because it's recycled newspaper it's it's finer 
uh, I guess, you know, whereas this can be slightly more coarse and it'll lock together in a different way and achieves the same kind of job. So yeah, right. it was, it was, it was, it was, the, you know, we were going down a cellulose route uh, and then ended up using the blown wood fiber insulation. Thanks so much if I may. It's cost optimal. Yeah. That's perfect. Thanks so much. If I may ask a brief follow-up, which is that if you kind of had this one to do over again, what, what might you do differently? Uh, engineered I-beams, uh, maybe eight, uh, eight, three quarters of an inch. He's scrabbling around in UK metrics, you know, millimeters, 22 mil. Just give us a number uh, and we can convert it. Mark, yeah, don't, don't yeah, bust your brain. Yeah, You've already 20, done 20, today. 22 mil OSB with a nice you know, timber face on it that could, you know, with a bit of different detailing so it could still give a timber finish. That would be my preference, you know, um, if it was to try and try and uh, pacify Mick in, with his uh, internal wood finishes and things, but it would, it would change the character a little bit. But hey ho. Thanks so much. And Mark, I guess you're experiencing too, because I know this happened in France is, you know, UK and France are really demanding more, um, you know, carbon friendly materials. And so uh, uh, the wood fiber market is just, you know, blowing up because they're now having to take care of these two global markets with uh, with their products. And I mean, I know that we're, we're, we're seeing that right now with Gutex of having it tougher to find uh, enough in here and now there's many factory. So it's, it's yeah. great to see that policies help drive material changes. So, yeah, yeah. Well, I, th I think that, yeah, we're seeing things happening in France and Germany's had a good long stable kind of uh, wood based you know, uh, insulation market and things. Um, the UK is still quite a laggard in that respect, to tell you the truth. But because of uh, France's moves to use so much timber in its construction, we're seeing massive cost hikes uh, across the board. And that's having some major impacts. Um, but what I, I keep an eye on what's going on over the pond, and I know that uh, there's uh, um, some. I forget the name of the company, but they're looking to manufacture wood-based installations in in the states. I think it is. Yeah, yeah. Timber uh, and HP in in Maine. Yeah, which is fantastic, and I think uh, it'll be great to see that take off. Yeah. Um, again, a couple more questions. Um, Paul, you another one. We got Paul and then N. Larkin, and then I know Sandro's looking for some hemp wool that I'm trying to find the answer. So, this Paul, or is there another Paul? No, sorry, Paul, you, that's you. Sorry. Was that a question? I was really commenting on um, yeah, the underground swimming pool. I wondered, Mark, if you were aware of these Ethiopia arms at Corby, where they do what they call an earth energy bank, they drill holes at about a meter distance, I don't know, maybe 20 centimeters across, a number of these like piles, just a meter and a half down and so on, fill them with something which is uh, holds very high thermal capacitance and uh, and then they extract the heat in winter with uh, with a sheer, sheer uh, ground source heat pump. Uh, I've not heard of that particular approach. Um, yeah. Sorry, guys, I got reading the chat a bit too much there. Sorry, Paul, did you get your question answered? Well, there was, Sorry. yeah, I couldn't, I, yeah, I'd not heard of the technology that Paul was mentioning. Um, and yeah, it was, yeah, I, as I, again, I was emphasizing something that was community based. And I wasn't too sure whether uh, that's what I was trying to emphasize rather than particular techniques and technology. You know, it's, you know, it was that if you do it at a community scale, it becomes a lot more cost effective. Mark, and I appreciate you brought two of the three T's we talked about on Tuesday night, you know, the technical, the technique, and the technology. So just kind of put in the technical on that one. Um, and, and Larkin, you're next. Hi, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I had a question about uh, installation for my home. So um, I'm, a, I'm a super novice, but I'm trying to learn um, what is best and safe and sustainable. So um, I would appreciate your advice and guidance. Thanks, Ed Larkin. Just so you know, too, before Mark answers his question is, you know, come next Tuesday because Chris Magwood and his website, which uh, he works with is the Builders for Climate Action, um, has a lot of great info in um, insulation choices based on the carbon footprint. But Mark, you go ahead with your kind of top three 
go to installation items when you're when you're designing projects um well i think i think I, yeah mike I, I i there's a number of things running through my head uh basically i'm going to assume that uh, it's a timber frame kind of scenario that we're dealing with um and therefore uh yeah i it's you know, which is the right insulation i think it, it's I think it's a tough call. I think mineral wool is very straightforward and it's it's cost effective. Uh, I, th I know that there are so many climate zones in the US. To tell you the truth, I'm uncomfortable with answering the question simply because I couldn't give a, yeah, you know, I'd need to know an awful lot more about specific locale. What I could suggest um, is that you'd you know, find passive house designers in your area, speak to them about how to you know, develop a retrofit strategy um, that aspires to achieve benefit. Uh, because that's the the uh, passive house standards retrofit approach, um, and you can do it as a stepwise approach, so you don't have to do it all in one go. Um, you know, so you can do it to fit your budget at any one particular point in time. But having the the approach and the strategy is the key thing, and then you can implement it as and when you suit. So I'd, I'd speak to passive house designers uh, in your area, and, and and go from there. That's how that's the best way of choosing the right insulation for your project. Thank you so much. Mark, that, that was a really great answer because most people just default to it depends and you answered it completely without having to use it depends. So <sighs> again, you, you know, you're really good in passive house where you can answer it without saying it depends. So again, we're, we're lucky to have you today. Um, I think that's it for questions. Um, I, I think, Sandra, you're still looking for hemp. I know hemp architecture and there's another, there's a hemp manufacturer in Ontario and or sorry in um, in Quebec that I'm not sure if they're doing blown in hemp yet but they're definitely doing hemp insulation so um, I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to <laughs> get too many dials on behind you you guys just see me in this you know and what you see but behind there's, there's lots of monitors and stuff going on that I was trying to find you that link but it's out there um, so it's great that we're seeing and again just to kind of follow up to Mark again is you know, looking at when you're looking at insulations, looking at uh, an organic material that ideally will work in your situation scenario um, as a first choice. And then depending on, you know, again, the um, what the envelope is, then you might have to choose something else or, you know, those kinds of things. So, well, sir, I think you can go kiss your daughter and, and see if she actually went to bed or read her book. But uh, I think that's it for, for questions. Um, the one thing I got to just ask you to slow down and repeat because um, I was listening attentively when you said it, but I didn't write it down. Lloyd wanted to get your response to, um, you, you know, again, you were talking about the can and can not, and then you, you said about five points. Okay. I think Lloyd's, you know, asking because he may have a great new article coming out. He might want to reference this, but just, yeah. just saying. He wants to plagiarize my stuff again, hey? Yes, exactly. Like we <laughs> yeah. all do. Yeah. No, so so my theory is that people want control. Um, and so control comes with comes in cans, not cannots. Okay. It's what you can do, you can choose to do. But cans stands for comfort, air quality, noise, and sunlight. Right. Well, I'm plagiarizing that. So Sorry, I'm pausing your one because I want to make sure I wrote, I wrote it down. So. And if I did do a, uh, an interview on Ben Adam Smith's podcast, uh, House Planning Help, about the forever home lifestyle. And um, I kind of mentioned it in that context in, in that podcast, which goes further into 10 points about how to, you know, recognizing, you know, about more sustainable lifestyles and how Passive House can fit into that. Again, Mark, what was the podcast? Uh, House Planning Help is the name of the podcast uh and um yeah it was the forever home lifestyle which was the was the podcast that um we did awesome like everything else mark your knowledge in this is amazing but i also just appreciate just the language you use now quick to answer and just the easy answers i mean i know in the last year as i've grown my um passive house knowledge um, the language of trying to teach it and get people to buy in has is, is been my struggle and my, um, you know, really kind of diving into. So again, appreciate your time. Um, I think that's it, folks. Hopefully you enjoyed today. Mm -hmm.